The Battle of Samar was the centermost action during the Battle of Leyte Gulf and one of the largest naval battles in history. On October the 25th, 1944, one of the greatest last stands to take place in naval warfare occurred when the Americans, facing heavy casualties and overwhelming odds, ultimately prevailed against the might of the Imperial Japanese Navy Center Force under the command of Vice Admiral Takeo Kurita. I'm Liam Smith with Agent Smith Voice Productions, and in today's history video, I discuss a particular aspect on the Battle of Samar. The heroism and sacrifice of the United States Navy Task Unit TG-7743, call sign Taffy-3. Two of these ships I will mainly focus on, the destroyer USS Johnston and the destroyer escort USS Samuel B. Roberts. Combined with the destroyer's USS Hull, USS Herman, and a handful of escort carriers, they faced the powerful Imperial Japanese Center Force, led by the super battleship Yamato. The commander of the United States Third Fleet, William Bull Halsey, believed that the Japanese center force was no longer a threat after the Battle of the Serbian Sea. In response, he sent his powerful Third Fleet to the northeast to intercept a Japanese center force consisting of four carriers, two battleships, three light cruisers, and nine destroyers. However, this turned out to be a decoy fleet to lure the Americans away. The decision by Halsey to engage the decoy fleet had left the door open for Takeo Karita to plan his next move. When he withdrew after the Battle of the Serbian Sea on October the 24th, the Americans had assumed that he was retreating for good. However, under the cover of darkness, the Japanese flotilla turned round and slipped through the San Bernardino Strait at 3am, steaming southwards along the coast of Samar. This powerful fleet, consisting of four battleships, six heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and 11 destroyers, would attack the hugely depleted force covering the US landings. It was just before sunrise on the Philippine Sea of Samar Island on October the 25th, 1944. Steaming east of the island was the escort carrier St. Lo, which had launched a four-plane anti-submarine patrol, whilst the remaining carriers of Taffy 3 prepared for the day's airstrikes against the landing beaches. Then at 6.37, a Grunman TBF Avenger piloted by William C. Brooks sighted a number of ships of which he expected were Halsey's third fleet. However, these ships were not American. They were Japanese. Rear Admiral Clifton Sprague, who was in charge of Taffy 3, was astonished when he was notified by radio and asked for positive identification. Flying in for a closer look, Brooks reported back, I can see pagoda masts, 
I see the biggest meatball flag on the biggest battleship I ever saw. This large rising sun flag was raised atop the super battleship Yamato. She and her sister ship Musashi were the largest and most powerful warships ever designed. Musashi was sunk from 17 bombs and 19 torpedoes during the Battle of the Serbian Sea the previous day, and she was the main focus of the aerial attack. Yamato, however, had been hit with two armor-piercing bombs by aircraft from USS Essex and took on 3,370 tons of water, but remained battle-worthy. She displaced more than all of Taffy 3's ships combined, weighing 72,808 tons and equipped with nine 18-inch 45 caliber Type 94 naval guns, the most powerful naval artillery ever mounted on a warship. Each of these guns could lob an armor-piercing shell weighing as much as a small car, an unprecedented range of 25 miles. The biggest guns on Taffy 3 were the 5 inch 38 caliber guns mounted on the decks of the destroyers and the destroyer escorts. They were designed for use against aircraft and lightly armored targets. At 6.45 a.m., Taffy 3's first contact of Caritas Force was a visual sighting of anti-aircraft fire to the northwest. Five minutes later, Rear Admiral Clifton Sprague ordered a formation course change and directed his escort carriers to launch their Wildcat and TBM Avenger torpedo bombers with whatever ammunition they had loaded. Afterwards, the fleet would withdraw towards a rain squall to the east, hoping that bad visibility would reduce the accuracy of Japanese fire. Sprague issued the order for his destroyers to the rear of the formation to lay smoke, thus marking the retreating carriers. Taffy 2 to the southeast also launched their aircraft at Caritas Force. The Japanese, however, had caught the American aircraft unprepared as many were armed with high explosives for land operations, rather than armor-piercing bombs for ships. Shortly afterwards, at 7 a.m., Yamato's massive six forward-facing 18-inch guns erupted in simultaneous orange flashes of flame at the escort carrier USS White Plains. I unfortunately couldn't find any real archive footage of this incredible warship, except some rare photos and a few seconds of film of one of her salvos straddling white planes, as much of the archive film and photos were destroyed by the Japanese. The CGI footage of Yamato was from the Japanese war film The Great War of Archimedes, and the awesome gun sound effects are from the free-to-play naval game World of Warships. Just listen to this. What is really fascinating to note here is that the Japanese warships used different colored die markers, also known as spotter die. These allowed the Japanese to spot their own shells and make targeting adjustments. As Admiral Sprague noted, wicked salvos straddled the USS White Plains, and then colored geysers began to spout among all the other carriers in various shades of pink, green, red, yellow, and purple. The splashes had a kind of horrid beauty. Yamato was the only Japanese battleship that morning that could fire a simultaneous six-shell salvo from her forward batteries. The other battleships involved were Nagato, Kongo, and Haruna. They had only two barrel main batteries instead of Yamato's three barrel per turret configuration. Yamato would fire four salvos at USS White Plains. Her second salvo, fired from a distance of 19.65 miles, goes down as arguably the longest shot in naval history. 
One of her shells exploded directly under the keel of the carrier, which caused her to lose power and receive significant structural damage. She would withdraw from the battle to head home for repairs, and would be in dry dock until the conclusion of World War II. Yamato, along with the battleship Congo, turned their guns to the escort carrier USS Gambia Bay. She managed to outmaneuver everything the Japanese fired at her for about 30 minutes, as she was continuously changing course to confuse the enemy gunners. Then at 8.10am, the escort carrier received her first hit, which caused fires on the flight deck and in the hangars. Eventually, a salvo from Yamato's main battery struck the carrier's forward engine room, causing immense flooding, and ultimately sending her to the bottom. I will now draw your attention to the two ships of Taffy 3 I mentioned at the start of this video, the destroyer USS Johnston and the destroyer escort USS Samuel B. Roberts. Along with the destroyers USS Hull and USS Herman, they pulled off some of the most extraordinary acts of bravery in naval history. The charge was led by Commander Ernst E. Evans of the USS Johnston. Just after seven o'clock, and without consulting his commanders, Evans laid down a protective smokescreen whilst zigzagging towards the enemy. Roughly ten minutes later, Gunnery Officer Robert opened fire at the attackers, registering several hits on the heavy cruiser Kumano superstructure, which erupted into flames. In response, the Japanese fleet turned their guns towards the USS Johnston and fired. Massive shells caused huge fountains of water all around the destroyer, but she still kept on zigzagging and opened up with her 127mm guns, firing a phenomenal 200 rounds into Kumano. At 4.4 nautical miles, she fired a full salvo of 10 torpedoes, they slammed into Kumano, and the resulting explosion ripped her bow clean off. At 7.16, inspired by the daring charge of Johnston, Admiral Sprague issued Commander William Doe Thomas aboard Hull, who was in charge of the small destroyer screen, to initiate torpedo runs. The two destroyers Hull, Herman, and the small destroyer escort Samuel B. Roberts threw themselves through the smoke screen into the battle. Shortly afterwards, the Japanese heavy cruiser Suzuya was soon assaulted by a barrage of air attacks from the escort carriers. She was struck with two air-to-ground bombs and badly damaged, pulling out of formation alongside the crippled Kumano. Suzuya would eventually sink at 1.22pm from the air attack. The relentless torpedo and air attacks caused immense confusion to Corito's fleet, giving the impression that he was facing a powerful carrier task force. He stated, Major warships were separating all the time because of the destroyer torpedo attacks. He realized that he was losing more tactical control every time his ships had to turn to avoid Taffy 3's torpedoes. At 7.30 a.m. and at close proximity with the enemy, the USS Johnston took a battering from Yamato's main battery shells, which passed through her deck and into her port side engine room, cutting her speed in half to 17 knots, and disrupting electrical power to her aft gun mounts. Moments later, three 6.1-inch shells from Yamato's secondary battery slammed into the bridge of the Johnston. This was evidenced by her after-action report, but what is interesting to note here is that the Americans didn't know the shell caliber of Yamato's main battery was 18-inch. It states, Ship sustained first hits, which were composed of a salvo of three 14 or 16-inch projectiles, followed very closely by three 6-inch projectiles. The Johnston was in a terrible state. She had been hit by the most 
powerful salvo in naval history. I was able to find Japanese naval records of this encounter. A small note on this statement is that it incorrectly refers to Johnston as a cruiser. A charging cruiser emerges from behind the smoke. Yamato engages her from a distance of more than 10 miles and scores a hit from the first salvo. The target is seen burning before it is lost sight of. But miraculously, against all the odds, this tough little destroyer was still functioning, and finding sanctuary in a rain squall, the crew had precious time to repair the damage, restoring power to her two or three aft gun mounts. Her search radar was completely destroyed, but her fire control radar, although damaged, was soon restored to working order. Through the swirling rain, the USS Herman and the USS Hull passed the crippled ship, and although severely wounded, Commander Evans saluted the destroyers as they charged the Japanese flotilla. Eventually, at 9.45am, the crippled Johnston would lay dead in the water, with Evans giving the order to abandon ship. She would sink 25 minutes later, with 186 of her crew. Evans escaped the ship, but was sadly never seen again. He was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions. As the Japanese destroyer Yukikazi cruised slowly past, several surviving crewmen noticed the captain salute the sinking Johnston. It was one of the few acts of gallantry shown that morning. It was just before 8 a.m., and the destroyer escort USS Samuel B. Roberts was about to pull off a daring attack of her own. The little ship would be known as the destroyer escort that fought like a battleship. Against the orders of his superior officer, and inspired by Evans' charge, Commander Robert W. Copeland proceeded at full speed following the USS Herman in attacking the Japanese heavy cruisers. Under the cover of a smokescreen laid down by the destroyers, the Roberts was able to avoid detection from the Japanese warships. Copeland denied his gunnery captain permission to fire, as he didn't want to draw attention to his ship even though targets were in firing range. At 8.10am, whilst the Roberts was nearing the carrier formation, the Japanese heavy cruiser Jikuma appeared out of the rain and fired her fore and aft armaments at the escort carriers. Upon seeing this, Copeland gave the order for his gunnery captain to open fire. For the next 35 minutes, the two ships traded broadsides, and the little destroyer escort would fire an astonishing 600 rounds from her 127mm guns into the heavy cruiser. Jikuma, whilst possessing a more powerful armament, had a slower rate of fire and was unable to hit the destroyer escort. Unbeknownst to the Roberts, she was soon joined by USS Herman, who engaged the heavy cruiser, putting her in a deadly crossfire. Jikuma's superstructure was devastated by armor-piercing and high-explosive ammunition. Several fires erupted along her superstructure, with her number three gun mount put out of action. Just like Suzuya, Jakuma would eventually succumb to relentless air attacks by TBM Avenger torpedo bombers, launched by the escort carrier USS Kitkun Bay. At 8.51am, the Roberts was straddled by a withering volley of multicolored salvos from Yamato, Nagato, and Haruna. Desperately trying to dodge the incoming shells, Copeland tried to fall back, but now the little destroyer escort was becoming an easy target for the Japanese. Then, all of a sudden, Copeland reported a tremendous explosion with the impact of two 14-inch shells fired from the Japanese battleship Congo. The explosion blew a long, jagged hole in the destroyer escort's port side. It wiped out the number two engine room, burst the after-fuel tanks, and started several fires on the fantail. Eventually, at 9.10 a.m., the order was given to abandon ship, and the Samuel B. Roberts rolled over 
and sank at 10.05 a.m. Three officers and 86 men were either killed, missing, or died of wounds. Amidst all this destruction and carnage, the Yamato and the other ships which had engaged Task Force Tavi 3 were under constant harassment from strafing planes launched from the escort carriers. Shortly after the sinking of the USS Johnston, the Yamato would be forced to take evasive action to avoid torpedoes launched by the destroyer USS Hull, but not before landing the killing blow on Hull from her secondary guns. After veering away north for 10 minutes to avoid the torpedo salvo launched by Hull, Yamato turned back into the battle, firing her 18-inch guns onto the escort carrier USS Gambia Bay, which, as I mentioned earlier in the video, sank under intense shelling from the battleship. Eventually, due to the evasive actions to avoid the torpedoes, Yamato was forced out of the engagement. Kurita had lost what should have been the most effective gun platform at the height of the battle. At 9.25 a.m., he ordered rendezvous, my course, North Speed 20. His intention was to regroup his scattered ships. But as the battle raged on, and it was becoming increasingly clear that the prospect of heading back towards Samar Island was not going to happen, Kurita officially withdrew his centre force at 1.10 p.m. His decision to withdraw was based on a lack of solid information, as no one was able to provide him any reliable intelligence on the true strength of Taffy 3. Yamato would only see a handful of battles during the Second World War, which eventually led to her sinking during Operation Tanichigo. But during the Battle of Samar, the battleship exceeded all expectations. She sank one escort carrier, the USS Gambia Bay, with an 18-inch shell to the engine room, hit and sunk the destroyer USS Johnston with a three 18-inch salvo broadside sank the USS Hull with her six secondary batteries and managed to severely damage the escort carrier USS White Plains with the longest shot in naval history, 19.65 miles. Without the effective role of the aircraft carrier during the Second World War, Yamato would have been the ultimate naval weapon she was originally designed to be. Despite her success during Leyte Gulf, Operation Shogo was a complete disaster for the Imperial Japanese Navy, which ceased to be an effective fighting force. Thank you so much as always for watching, I really enjoy making these history videos, and don't forget to give us a like and to subscribe for more content. Finally, to my awesome subscribers, your contribution and ongoing support has been so helpful, it really means the world to me. Liam Smith with Agent Smith Voice Productions. Until then, Stay tuned, I'll see you next time.